Hello and welcome. His determination to solve one of the most serious medical conditions in the world led him to develop a simple yet effective device. But with success came the challenge of defending his creation and then trying to improve it. This week on 101, meet the Argentinian cardiologist and inventor of the stent, Dr. Julio Palmas. As a young working-class lad studying diligently in Buenos Aires and graduating as a young doctor, Julio Palmas could hardly have imagined that he'd one day create a device to revolutionize heart medicine. But his drive to find a less invasive way to treat cardiovascular disease led him to experiment with wire mesh, creating a small cylinder that would eventually save millions of lives. He and his partner, Dr. Richard Schatz, had laboriously tried and tested the device, from Rusty the dog to the first patient in 1986. In fact, in 2002, a massive blockage in his own heart took Julio Palmas full circle, a doctor who became a patient saved by his own invention. Dr. Palmas, good chance to have a talk with you. Thank you for your time. My pleasure, thanks. Now, you changed the direction of uh, heart medicine with uh, your invention of the stent. Uh, it was described as one of the 10 patents that has changed the world uh, in the last century. But now, even today, the way people lead their lives fast food, less uh, exercise, a more sedentary lifestyle. They seem to be doing everything to make the situation worse. And we know that heart disease is one of the most serious conditions to, to be considered nowadays. Um, do, you see, do you see society tackling this disease or this issue with enough enthusiasm and the seriousness it deserves? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a daily realization that our lives are changing. And like you said, the, we work more, uh, we rest less, we exercise less, and we uh, essentially do a lot of things that uh, eventually will be against us. Uh, so it is very important to, uh, most important of everything is prevent disease. But then once you have it, uh, you know, you have to have a quick and effective way to treat it. In fact, this is one of the things that people seem to count on technology developing. And, and taking them to the next step of survival. And, and I guess, uh, uh, well, I was going to ask you how you feel technology will develop, certainly in the case of uh, cardiopulmonary uh, or cardiovascular uh, disease. Well, the, the big contrast was uh, bypass surgery versus something else. In the 80s, bypass surgery was an, an incredible advance. The problem is that it was not a popular thing. I mean, you couldn't really fix the number one killer in the world with such a drastic therapy, you know, open the chest and do a bypass on a failing heart. Uh, obviously, that was the motivation in my case, to try to come up with something that would be minimal, minimal invasive and simple, and uh, that actually could uh, you know, make a big change in a short period of time. And do you, when you look at the health industry, you know, everything is so commercialized, do you worry that people are really going in the wrong direction when it comes to approaching health care and so on, that it's all about the brands and the money? <clears throat> I think it's a mixture of things. I think uh, we're doing some things better. <clears throat> and other things we, not so good. Um, certainly we are exercising less and eating more. But I think there is a, there is a new realization that you know, there are things out there that in our lifestyle that could be against us and we're trying to fix it. I think most people realize that. Let me take you back to those early days. You were born in uh, Buenos Aires <coughs> in Argentina. Uh, and and y you were aware early on of how big the sprawl of the city was. But your life was confined to small uh, housing or quarters uh, stuck behind a laundry within the sound of the bells, the, the Lutheran church bells nearby, which really pretty much <laughs> interrupted your life. Now, what do, you, uh, what do you remember of those early days? <coughs> well, I mean, uh, it was like uh, looking at the big world outside. I mean, I was not in it. Uh, uh, yeah, Buenos Aires was a glittering, uh, huge, sprawling uh, world that uh, was actually evolving besides me. Okay, being disadvantaged, it gives you uh, the challenge and perhaps the motivation to go beyond. Uh, so you wonder sometimes if, if it wouldn't have been like that, that perhaps you would, would have been content with just lead on uh, maybe just like a regular life rather than be a fighter all your life, you know? Now, I gather your father, uh, Andres, was a, a bus driver, essentially. He spent, yes. Yeah, and, uh, but he was always trying to, to set up businesses and always failing. And I know you described him as being too trusting. Why was that? Well, yeah, my dad was too trusting. That's exactly it. Uh, that defines him well. I mean, he always uh, was hoping that everybody around him was there to help him. And uh, so I saw from his failures also, you know, an, an, a lesson of not to trust everybody, just to be uh, feeling that you're on your own. You what, what other characters have you got from him? What, how has he shaped your character? Well, I mean, he, he was an entrepreneur. He, he was always trying to start something new. 
fail and start again. So I think per perseverance probably was the biggest uh, lesson he taught me. Now he loved American jazz and, and he was very keen for, to make sure that you learned English at an early age, which actually looking back on it uh, was a very, very wise thing to do, wasn't it? Yeah, for somebody that uh, had very little resources and, um, you know, to spend, had the foresight to send me to a British school early on to learn the language. I think it was, I mean, it was very important for me. It gave me the wings. You didn't get it at the time, though, did you? I think it was later you realized how important that was. Oh, absolutely. I hated it. You know, a nine-year-old in a British school, of, I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, just for language. I mean, of course, you know, I hated it, yeah. Now, what about your, your mother? She was the daughter of uh, Italian immigrants, and I know you describe her as very warm and caring. She was very much a family woman. Um, how did she influence your character? What did you get from her? Well, my mom was uh, very humble, and uh, she, uh, she essentially uh, supported my dad and the family, and, you know, the, the same thing. They were hardworking people. You know, it was interesting. Uh, I was reading how you, were, you, were, uh, you had a mild form of numbers dyslexia. Uh, as a boy, but it wasn't really diagnosed at the time. I guess no one was really looking for that kind of thing. Do you feel it had an impact on your life? I mean, in what way did it affect what you did? Well, it was it, it was actually a blend into other limitations I had. I really didn't know I had it, uh, so I, I thought I was just plain stupid, or perhaps I didn't have the intelligence to, you know, to express myself well, and uh, I just had that thing on top of that. But I think all those are hurdles that you just have to overcome, and you know, just makes models your character. You had the intelligence, though, to go advertise yourself as a dance instructor at the age of 12, which got you the girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that gave me an edge in uh, my social life. Yeah. And what do you recall of those times? I mean, was it pretty, uh, pretty much a happy time at that? You know, was it carefree to some degree? It was, and you know, because uh, the, the problem is uh, it, it, it was a not an even society at the time. There were advantages and disadvantages uh, among families, and you know, the kids that had everything, of course, you know, they were happier. I mean. Uh, and, and I, I wasn't a part of that. Now you raced fast cars and sports cars now, but your first one was a blue Fiat 600 your father got you from medical <laughs> That's school. That's correct. <laughs> That's right. Good memories of that? My very first wheels, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How was, I mean, what were you able to do in terms of your lifestyle and, uh, at that time? What were the, the, the things that you were able to get up to? This is, of course, a time when, I guess, television, cable, satellite, these things really didn't exist. Well, you know how it is. I mean, at that time, it's everything about little stuff that kids dwell on. You know, having a nice T-shirt and your shoes and all that, and uh, to try to impress the girls, and you know, and so whatever you, you know, your glance actually. Well, your father and, and your mother, Graciela, uh, sacrificed a lot. Basically, uh, it seems you know, going through the story, um, to make sure that you had a good, good future. And I wonder how that, what you witnessed them doing for you, has affected the way you are with, with your daughter Florence and your son Christian. Well, you know, obviously, uh, I think my parents gave me as much as they could. I'm doing the same thing with my children, so, you know, of course I can give them more. Um, but uh, I, 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 th that's the way we raise kids, and I don't know if it is probably uh, our social background. We tend to give the kids, you know, all the help we can. When did you notice a change in the way your life was, was going, you know, and, and when did you feel things were starting to improve, you know, from this nerdy kid who was a bit of an outcast? Yeah, definitely, definitely when I went to medical school, you know, that not that I had a big passion for medical school, but being in higher education, <clears throat> all of a sudden I realized that it was a different game. It was not about, you know, having your rackets or, you know, your playing, playing football or, you know, having all the things that the other kids had, but rather just your brain. And uh, so all of a sudden I realized I had a brain and I, I, I could get good grades and uh, a new scoring system of your efforts. Uh, it really was very rewarding. What was, what was uh, Buenos Aires like at that time in terms of opportunity? What, w what was there that you could do that you could see? You know, I mean, was it uh, an encapsulated world or could you see the bigger world out there? Mm, well, it was, I mean, at least from my point of view, it was very nepotistic. Uh, if you had the connections, you had the family, the background, and people that would lead you along, you know, giving the opportunity, they would show you where the doors are, you, you, you went ahead. If you didn't, then it was very difficult. And uh, so, again, another challenge, I modeled character, you know, because I just couldn't do things, even after I graduated as a doctor, I, I, you know, I didn't see the doors. Who, who influenced you the most at that time? Who were you lo really looking to for advice and leadership and guidance? At the time, I, you know, I just didn't have a chance to reach and, you know, one of those big thinkers. Uh, I, 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 I actually uh, watched him from afar. Uh, but definitely, my early professors m made a big influence on me. Uh, you know, even if I was in the back of a, ro of a room full of people, it still uh, it was very, very uh, stimulating to hear them talking. 
And was the society quite open-minded at the time? Again, it was my, percep my perception, you know, I cannot really uh, judge society as a whole at the time. I think we have gone beyond that. Uh, I think uh, there's more opportunity today. Uh, there are better ways to discover talent uh, so that, uh, you know, you don't have to fight so much to get there, uh, to be recognized. Well, there was an interesting turning point in your life. We're going to get to that in just a moment. More questions for you in a moment, Dr. Palmas. We're going to take a short break here, more one-on-one -on -one when we come back.